from IIT Gantinaga. It's a great pleasure. He will be telling us about enhanced collective performance of multiple bosonic engines. Very much looking forward to it. Uh, the stage is yours. All right. Uh, thanks, Nelly. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, uh, it, it's great. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give a talk here. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity. Um, I very much wish it was in person, uh, uh, not least because I love Korea. Uh, but uh, somehow this is the new reality and uh, it's still fun to see some uh, uh, friends always. So let me, uh, before I get into the meat of the talk, let me just begin by saying where I'm at right now for some of you uh, who are wondering. So I am uh, currently in the Western part of India, just North of Mumbai in a city called Gandhi Nagar, uh, which is close to this big city called Ahmedabad. I'm in a research institute, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in a uh, place called the Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhi Nagar. This is located on the banks of this river called Sabarmati. This is roughly where I am right now. And a little uh, south of this river is where Gandhi, if you know Gandhi uh, had his uh, ashram. Uh, and this is our campus and hopefully uh, at a more nicer time, uh, some of you or all of you can come visit. Uh, and the work that I'm going to talk about today is a collaboration with, uh, uh, again, it came out of a collaboration with Gentaro, who's in the audience, Peter Myungjung, who's uh, in Duke Kunshan now, and then Adolfo. Uh, and this is based on the paper that I'm pointing to here, uh, just published last year. Okay, here's an uh, outline of the talk. Um, I'll begin with a very short introduction to uh, quantum heat engines because a lot of you are already invested in this. Uh, I won't uh, belabor the points too much, but I'll do it in a manner so that I can situate the particular problem that we have tackled. Um, following this, I'll describe the setup of our work and uh, I'll give an overview of the setup on the main result to begin with uh, that we had. Uh, following that, uh, I'll go on to a little bit more detail, even within the setup to uh, describe the exact thing that we worked on. And hopefully that will allow you to appreciate and understand the results that I present in the final section. So as I told Nelly, um, please uh, keep asking questions either by unmuting yourself if that's allowed or uh, also on the chat, uh, Nelly can interrupt me whenever um, so I, I'm more interested in having a good conversation, which is what we are all lacking these days in some sense, uh, more than just me going one way. Um, so uh, with that, let me move to the introduction. Okay. All right. So what are quantum heat engines? Uh, Marty just gave a fantastic talk uh, telling us about some very interesting aspects of it. Very simply, these are machines that convert heat to work except now the working fuel are quantum systems, right? So one way to appreciate and understand quantum heat engines, there are many ways, uh, is to classify them, right? So I wanted to give a very brief uh, sort of, uh, let's say a hazy classification of quantum heat engines. One can broadly divide them into two kinds. One are these continuous heat engines where there is a system of interest that is always in contact with the hot and the cold bath and the heat currents are converted into work. Right. And this work typically, if this system of interest that is connected to the baths is some kind of a simple two level or multi level quantum system, the work is essentially going to be in uh, if these are atoms, this would be uh, photons from the atom and work output would be if this system lasers. This is the original idea that came out of uh, Schulz Dubow's uh, famous paper. Um, of course, uh, that's one way of thinking of a continuous heat engine, but also an interesting addition would be if you can couple these uh, systems in between to a piston and the system can actually deliver quantized work in some sense uh, to, uh, to another system, which is called the piston. So that's one another variation. Uh, and both of these are equivalent uh, in some sense, and they are very interesting uh, ways of characterizing the same physics. Um, so that's one example. Uh, the second kind of uh, heat engine is precisely of the kind that Marty told us about. Basically, these are discrete cyclic heat engines where uh, a single quantum system is sort of coupled and uncoupled with 
two different paths and in between an external agent changes the hamiltonian of the system and uh, does uh, work or gets work out of the system uh, during this entire cycle okay so i am uh, picturing here what's called an auto cycle which i'll get into because that's the kind of cycle i'm going to consider in detail later but for now this is uh, as a broad classification this is one kind of engine okay and one question that one can ask here again is who gets the work uh, if you did not have a for example in the continuous heat engines if you did not have a piston uh, heat uh, sorry the work is essentially uh, in terms of some photons that are emitted by the atoms but in this uh, four stroke type of engines uh, since there is an external agent that is changing the hamiltonian to do work it is that agent that gets the work right so that's sometimes called as a semi classical heat engine and uh, so that's sort of the broad classification of the heat engine right the two kinds of heat engines one can think of uh, quantum heat engines one can think of okay with that let me move to uh, what's the uh, sort of in, what sort of interesting questions can one ask one set of interesting questions was what uh, marty was talking about uh, about optimizing and looking at uh, power finite uh, power uh, at carnot efficiency and these sorts of questions but even that question falls into this general category um, of what uh, can quantum heat engines do that is better than equivalent classical heat engine so are there ways to get some interesting enhancement of any figure of merit uh, and uh, or even some very interesting differing behavior from classical engines and there are broadly speaking a few different strategies to do this i'm going to describe some of the strategies as i understand of course if your favorite strategy is not represented or your paper or the paper that you like is not represented i apologize uh, it's it's just uh, an oversight okay so what are the strategies so one uh, obvious strategy is that you don't want quantum systems to just be classical systems plus discrete levels so there is this idea that you can use quantum coherence in this fuel uh, to enhance the power output that's one strategy so then other strategies would be uh, changing not the fuel but basically the heat paths if you have non standard heat paths like squeezed paths or even replace one of these heat paths by a quantum measurement so this is again a very nice strategy to see physics that's very different from a classical heat engine then of course there is this very interesting thing uh, partly uh, in the many body systems approach that marty specified in the end where one can have many uh, particles that have collective effects and typically this can happen due to these many particles interacting or by the way that we interact with such an ensemble of many particles the way that we apply our unitaries can be very interesting uh, the unitaries can actually couple the particles in this process then what you get is an advantage due to collective effects from interactions or engineering such collective effects okay so that's one uh, way to get a quantum advantage and finally uh, another way that's a little bit more dear to me because uh, we have worked on it a little bit is to actually go the piston way right so if you have this continuous heat engine you can attach a piston so you can actually do the same and attach a piston or a load system that actually takes uh, care of the fact that the work output when you run this engine goes to another quantum system so if you couple such a quantum system then of course again you can see some very interesting physics come out of it uh, one of which is uh, was reported a little while ago uh, in, in this paper here where uh, one has to revisit the concept of uh, the cycles right so if uh, if you if you run an engine for one cycle this is the same as running it for n cycles in terms of energy that it uh, sort of puts on another another coupled system so the answer is no and that's why it's again an interesting situation that even in principle uh, a quantum system uh, that acts as an engine does something different okay good so these are the strategies broadly and what i want to talk about today uh, my talk is going to be based on these last two strategies a combination of last two strategies where i'm going to consider collective effects uh, in in a in a system uh, of heat engines which arises not due to you know interactions or engineering per se but more due to the fact that these engines themselves have quantum statistics they will be indistinguishable bosons to be specific and i'm also going to have them dump their energy into another uh, coupled system 
so the my talk is basically going to be on this combination effect okay uh, that's the introduction so now i i can move on to my uh, setup so okay so the setup I'd, I'd like to consider is basically this uh, total complex system, which is uh, has two main parts. One part of it, I'm going to, uh, we will look into each of these parts in detail now, but broadly there is two parts to it. One is a part which is work, which is called R, which is the set of work resources. It will have the engines and um, a set of a couple of baths, a hot and a cold bath. And this is the, this is the part that actually is your work repository, which can actually do work. And what it does is we couple this system, uh, this R system to an uh, external quantum system. And we are interested in how the energy of this external quantum system changes. And we want to take that as a measure of the output of the engine. That is the broad setup. And now slowly we'll go a little bit deeper and deeper. Um, so totally, of course, this Hamiltonian has to have three parts. One is this part. And one is the coupling between the work resources and the system. And then finally, the system itself. Okay, and uh, the system uh, coupling, which I'm going to take is going to be of this factorized form, there is some operator from the uh, from the work resource side and there is some operator from the system side and to be more precise I'm going to always couple just the engines and not the heat baths with the system that will become a little bit clear in a moment, and that's the setup that we uh, start with. Okay, so now let's look a bit deeper into the different components of this system. Right. So uh, the first part is basically this work resource. I have here basically uh, a set of N quantum heat engines. These are going to be uh, in the first, uh, these, these can be either indistinguishable particles or distinguishable particles. In the case that they are taken as an indistinguishable particles, what I will focus on is a situation where there are basically, think of N bosonic particles and imagine that these bosonic particles are in a trap and they have been trapped to the lowest uh, vibrational state. So essentially their center of mass motion is negligible. And in addition, they basically have two internal levels A and B, okay? In this situation, my Hamiltonian for these engines, for this N indistinguishable bosonic engines, uh, is going to be of this form. Uh, most importantly, it will become clear what this omega and delta are. Basically, I'm going to make a protocol where the Hamiltonian will change as a function of time, where will make an auto cycle. But uh, the key is that <coughs> the operators that are involved in the engine Hamiltonian are all collective in the sense that uh, SZ is giving the population difference between these two internal states and SX is giving the coherence between these two internal states. And these, will uh, essentially, if I have n atoms, this will basically have a basis of n plus one. These are like collective spins in a sense, okay? So that's the situation when I have n indistinguishable heat engines, okay? And when I, I can, and what I want to do here is to compare the performance of such an indistinguishable ensemble with an equivalent ensemble where my engines are distinguishable. For this, you can imagine instead some uh, kind of pinned impurity like some solid state matrix or some solid state qubits whose positions uh, you can easily distinguish. As a result, you basically have an array of uh, two level systems, right? So this is, again, we will use the same protocol for both cases, but except here now, the total Hilbert space is going to scale as two to the n. It's going to be two to the n. So this is completely distinguishable and this is the situation. And now coming to the Hamiltonian as such of this resource, there are going to be the following parts. One is this engine Hamiltonian that's going to be a function of time. This function of time is basically going to be described by whatever uh, engine cycle I'm going to take. And this HED of T tells me the coupling between the engine and the paths. Of course, this is going to be turned on and off during my uh, engine cycles. And HB, which is the path, is always constant. And I'm taking the cycle to be of uh, time capital T. Okay, so that's my total cycle and over this cycle. And what I'm going to do then is next, I'm going to talk about the coupling between <clears throat> the uh, work resources and the external system, right? So in this case, I want to say that during the work strokes of my uh, uh, engine cycle, I'm going to also switch on a coupling between the engines, right? And 
basically the system of interest. In the case that I have an indistinguishable set of particles, this coupling is again going to be collective because of the statistics. And I'm basically going to get, uh, I'm going to assume a coupling of the following form where my original Hamiltonian had both SC and SX and the coupling Hamiltonian has SX from the engine side and there is basically a system operator. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this system operators and the system itself as general as possible until I cannot anymore. Uh, but I can I, we can basically describe most of our results within uh, basically uh, a very general system uh, case, okay? And in this case, now, if we uh, look at the distinguishable version of this coupling, what will happen is instead of coupling uh, this total SX, I'll be coupling the individual sigma X of the uh, each of these engines, okay? So I uh, thought I saw a raised hand, yeah, yeah. There is a question by John Rupp. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sorry, uh, so, when you couple this uh, engines and the system, uh, I've seen some literatures that using uh, some energy conserving unitaries to make sure that this coupling itself does not uh, pump, like put energy into this uh, external system or like extract work from it. And I think uh, in this form of coupling, uh, this uh, coupling itself will cause some energetic uh, Sure sure, 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 sure. This is a very important question and more or less this is the question that took us the longest time to get this paper published, uh, to be completely honest. Um, it's an interesting question. So the answer I have is I can choose these uh, sometimes called these heat bath couplings. Um, the effects that I'm talking about will work in that little bit. Um, for general cases, we did think long and hard about can we actually uh, discount in some manner the energy that is input by turning on and off this HC? And what we see is that there is no one size fits all approach. We have one, I'll come to it in the end if there is time, uh, we have one approach where we make one measure and that measure also shows this statistical enhancement. Of course, this is not a very satisfactory answer. And the general answer is there is going to be uh, addition of uh, energy from the coupling. The question is, is it all that is happening? And the answer is no. It's not entirely just me switching on and off uh, the coupling. There is actually energy flow from the engines to the system. That much we can say. Uh, is this clear? Uh, yeah, OK, thank you. Yeah, but you can come back to it later. Yeah, OK. Okay, um, there is another question. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, so uh, I just wanted to ask, so you had mentioned that uh, the efficiency or the way you uh, look at the performance of this engine is by looking at how the energy of the out system changes. So, so, so yeah, so I just wanted you to ask like, uh, like, can you say a bit more about that? Like how would, how are you defining and Output or yeah, yeah. That, that that is the rest of the talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All, right. All right. So this is the setup. And so let's move on. So with this sort of broad, even with this broad setup, I can actually talk about what is my uh, what is our central result. So the central result is the following. As we as Bhavesh just pointed out, we are going to look at the internal energy change of this external system after one cycle and compare this uh, change for when the engines were indistinguishable versus when the engines are distinguishable, indistinguishable, indistinguishable bosons, I mean. So when you look at the ratio of this, we generically find that this ratio is larger than one, which means these indistinguishable engines tend to usually output more energy than distinguishable. So that's the central result. And we will get into more of what these figures are and so on in the rest of the talk, okay? So that's the main result or the take home message for the talk, okay? Good. So with that, now I would like to actually get into a little bit more details and tell you how to calculate this uh, internal energy change uh, and what is how does this enhancement in some sense appear through our considerations. So in order to do that, I want to first take this. Uh, so so this whole dabba, which is made up of the system, uh, external system, the, uh, the engines and the uh, paths, this whole thing is undergoing some unitary evolution. And so now I want to use that to calculate this uh, enhanced energy uh, formally. 
so the idea is that I have to first uh, take this part of the system that is part of the Hamiltonian that's not the coupling between the system and the engines and go to an interaction frame with respect to that. So then this is my HR of T and this is my H system. I have to go to an interaction frame with that. So I imagine that I begin with the system in some ground state, which has zero energy and the uh, engine in some initial state. Okay, the engines are all, uh, we'll see, I'll get to the engine cycle in a moment. Basically, they'll start with some, all the engines in equilibrium with some cold bath, and then we'll cut off the cold bath and start the auto engine strokes. And then once we have done the full cycle of the engines, then I can ask the question, what is the change in the energy of my external system? And that's basically going to be given by some expression like this, where EIS are the eigenstates of the system. And PI is the probability that if I do a final measurement on this system, after it has been detached from the uh, work resources, I get the eigenstate type, right? So this is just PI and I can calculate TI from just applying this unitary evolution over this initial state in the interaction picture. So this unitary evolution uh, in the interaction picture is basically just this expression time order integral of HCI. And this HCI has the all important coupling between the engines and the system. Okay. So now what can I do? Um, in order to sort of demonstrate my result in the simplest manner, I want to do things analytically. Secondly, I also want to be in a regime where my coupling to the engine. Uh, okay, so how would I do an analytical calculation? I would take the weak coupling GC of T. And of course, that is advantageous from a calculational point of view, but also physically, it's a little bit interesting because this will ensure that I am actually sort of dumping energy onto that system and it's not uh, sort of a strong coupling effect where the system also affects my engine and so on. To avoid those things, the coupling has also some intrinsic value, okay? So in that limit, what I can do is I can expand the unitary evolution there. And after a little bit of algebra, I'll see that my uh, probability, which is the all important quantity, I can basically express it in terms of the coupling protocol that I'm using. Uh, some matrix elements of the systems interaction alone, interaction picture operator alone. And this is the all important part where I have a correlation uh, operator between the uh, reservoirs, or sorry, the correlation operators between the engines uh, operators. Okay, And this will become clear once we get to an example or the exact case. If remember that this was SX, SX in the uh, collective case and sigma X, sigma X sum over in the in distribution case. Okay. So this is basically the final sort of uh, formally this is where I this is what I have to calculate and clearly this type these are Heisenberg picture operators and what we are writing here is basically that this BRI of T is basically the the evolution that comes from having the engine cycle. So you have an engine that is put through some cycle a bunch of engines in fact put through a cycle and this UR dagger represents the total unitary of the engine plus path. But we will now see that once you just consider the engine, it's just the usual auto engine that will uh, tell us what is this BRI of T, okay? And, <clears throat> and this part is very simple. This is just the system. And in the perturbative calculation, we are able to decouple these two dynamics in some sense, okay? So now the all important task is to calculate this BI. Okay, that's the main thing. Um, and this is as far as where one could get by being completely general. And now I have to really specify what exactly is the engine doing, what sort of protocol am I going to choose for the engine. And that's what I want to do in the next set of uh, results that I show you, where I show the calculation and we get fairly far even doing everything analytically and I'll also show some numerical results, okay? <clears throat> okay, all right, so as I said, now I have to really specify what the engines are doing. So the engines have these parts and let me actually describe an auto cycle just for the sake of uh, everyone's benefit, if you've not seen it before. And this is my engine Hamiltonian, which has the engines themselves, the baths and the coupling to the baths. And this is all periodic with some cycle time capital T. So how does it work? So initially I begin with the engines and the uh, bath at equilibrium with each other and the engine is equilibrium with the cold bath of the system. So that's my initial state. So after that, I, uh, we do a compression stroke, an isentropic compression stroke. What I'm describing is an auto cycle during which the Hamiltonian of my engines is changed. Remember that the Hamiltonian is this uh, 
to omega of Tz to delta Sx. And this is changed according to this protocol, some linear sweep, something like a n part, some n level Landau signal, if you will. And after I do this, during this process, my energy levels will separate. And at the end of this process, also more importantly, during this work stroke, this is the isentropic compression work stroke. During this work stroke, I, we turn on the coupling between the engines and the external system. This is also the time when basically my uh, engines can dump energy into the coupled system. Okay. And uh, second, uh, after this isentropic uh, compression, I we turn off the coupling to the external system and then couple the system, uh, the engines alone to the hot path and the engines come to equilibrium uh, with the hot path and the system is frozen at whatever reduced density matrix it was before we started the hot isocode. And again, we start with the product state between the system and the engines. And we do the second uh, uh, work stroke, which is this isentropic expansion part. And during this uh, expansion and compression part, we do not connect the engine and the path. So there is no direct energy flow from the engines uh, to the, uh, to the uh, system. There is no energy flow from the path to the engines during this process, okay? Uh, so in this isentropic part, we, we basically exactly just reverse this stroke and uh, with essentially, and again, the coupling to the uh, external system is set non-zero. And finally, we finish by bringing the engine uh, in all the engines. After setting the coupling to zero, we bring the engines back in equilibrium with the initial state. And this basically completes the cyclic process that the engines always come back to their initial state. So rho r of t plus tau is rho, of, rho r of t plus capital T is rho r of t. Okay, so this is the evolution. And with this evolution, we can actually work out for this evolution, this total evolution of this engines plus path, what is exactly the, uh, the uh, Heisenberg operator for the coupling uh, operator, right? So this VRI of T in our language is basically Sx of the engine, and we can now work out its time evolution very easily. Or in other words, we can calculate this UR of T0, okay? Good. So if you calculate that, then we can actually move on and uh, really calculate the, the central uh, observable, which is this uh, external engine, external systems energy change. Okay. Any we questions? Have, uh, questions? Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, can, can you go to the previous slide? So um, since, since in the isoentropic process, uh, can you tell me, like, because the energy level structure change, right? And this is not isothermal, so temperature also changes. So how, how do you show that the entropy stays constant in this process? So here, when we say isentropic, one means in the sense of uh, unitary evolution. So the density matrix, uh, the, 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 let's say the von Neumann entropy doesn't change. That's one way of saying it is isentropic. What should be is, the right thing to say is this is unitary evolution. During this process, at least there is no exchange of heat with the path. Of course, doesn't mean that this is an equilibrium. If, if I do it in finite time, as uh, Marty was talking about in the systems, I can get entropy production within the system. I'm in, in that sense, but it is unitary though. I see, so, so adiabatic so, would be the right word. Yeah, adiabatic would be the right word. Uh, so again, this this uh, I would say what it is, uh, what we call it, uh, we, we have to talk. What it is, is it's a unitary evolution. The path doesn't exchange any energy. And I'm putting energy by driving the system. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Ha, hey, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just uh, one uh, clarification. I mean, so this, uh, when the system coupling is turned off and off it's uh, off and on it's like just turned on and off right it's not slow uh, you mean the system's coupling is turned on and off yeah 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 in fact i'm going to do the exact opposite of slow that's okay. the simplest case i'm going to do an impulse coupling that's where i can do analytics very easily to show this advantage of course you can turn it on and off slow also if you want that is not a problem okay. yeah thanks yeah 
All right. So now we have discussed how does the uh, engine, how do the engines evolve, and this allows us to finally get to some results. Okay. So for the first set of results, I'm going to assume a particular kind of coupling, which is uh, basically turning on the coupling during one half of the stroke, right? The first half of the stroke. At some point during the first stroke, uh, first half uh, the idea, the expansion part, I basically make the coupling to the system on and then off. So it's a delta impulse coupling. Okay, so when one does that, why am I doing that? This is going to give me analytical insight. Uh, basically, this expression I had for the uh, energy, uh, for the probability, excitation probability of my external system, I can really simplify it. Okay, and all the information regarding how the engines affect this external uh, systems change is now in this variance of my uh, operator that I'm coupling to the system. Okay. Everything is at this variance evaluated at some time T1 when the kick is placed. Okay. Good. So now this is easy to uh, calculate uh, in two uh, limits. If my engine strokes are quasi-static, I can make uh, the unitary evolution during the expansion strokes. I can write the unitary evolution in this manner. So uh, I, I realize that this UR is, could be confused for the total evolution of the engine plus bath, but I'm really talking about the evolution of the engines when they are not in contact with the bath. This is this unitary strokes. And here I can, if my uh, omega of T is changed very slowly in this limit, I can basically write it in this manner, okay? Uh, which is just, uh, this is the quantum adiabaticity theorem, right? So I can write it in this manner where there is some phase that is from the dynamical phase and E is the instantaneous energy of my N level, energy gap of my N level system. And this angle is just telling me the ratio between omega and delta. A second case, which is very easy to uh, work with is if I actually work in a situation where I set this delta to zero, then of course, my angle, this angle just becomes pi over two and more, sorry, uh, let me just go finish this statement I was making. And if I'm in this limit, this evolution operator just becomes exact because basically my engine uh, Hamiltonian at different times commute with themselves. So commutes with each other. So at different times, the engine Hamiltonian commutes. So the adiabatic propagator is true for any sort of sweep of omega of t. So I'm not saying anything fantastic. It's just very simple physics. Okay, so with this, I'll be able to calculate uh, the evolution and hence what this BRI of T1 is. So let us look at the results from this, right? So, but the key to uh, understanding these results before I show the results is to see that this BRI of T1 whole squared, there is going to be a trace over the engine states coming from this initial point. So now the main difference between having a set of indistinguishable engines is that, as I said, the Hilbert space here has n plus one states, which are the collective spin states of the system. Whereas here, when you have uh, n two level systems, you have to trace over two to the n states. Okay, and of course the s, uh, the the sorry, the r operators are also going to be different, as we have already discussed. But this is very important that there is this two different. Uh, states, uh, two different traces that we are doing. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, it's a question. question yeah. yeah. Sorry, just a quick question. So, yeah. uh, when you say that it is exact uh, when delta equals to young, uh, zero, are you assuming that uh, this coupling does not change the engine state itself? The coupling does not change. Yeah, because I'm in this perturbative limit. So, oh, so in some sense, I'm, I'm talking about just the engines themselves. So forget about the coupling for a moment. This evolution that I'm talking about is for the engines alone, right? So if you look at this, this is all this evolution, this U is just for the engines. Whether the, the, the beauty of the uh, perturbative scheme is that I've sort of now separated the dynamics into the dynamics of the engine and dynamics of the system. So mm -hmm. then this has some meaning and this gives me some answer. But if I, you're right that uh, this kind of things cannot be done if I consider strong coupling between the engine and the uh, system, then uh, I cannot sort of look at the independent dynamics and get anything meaningful. Uh, but I think uh, if you want to like optimize, like maximize the work uh, stored in this system, uh, you need to also consider some large uh, coupling constants. Uh, so this is an interesting question. So the, the point is, uh, 
it's it's not obvious yet to me uh, if i want to uh, say out couple an engine and dump maximum energy as possible to another quantum system what sort of couplings one should choose this is independent of this talk this is a generic question that is interesting one of the issues if you go to very strong coupling uh, in my head that i always have is that this is two quantum systems you're coupling there is always going to be some uh, sort of back and forth of the energy you have to somehow find uh, a way of at least making this energy exchange uh, one way uh, of some kind of non reciprocal way this is not obvious to me what is the best strategy to do this at the moment i am using weak coupling as a proxy until we find a better and smarter way to out couple engines that's what i think uh, i i have comment so so i think mm -hmm. i think the way uh, to to make it one way maybe one thing can be to to operate in a regime where there is a large number of large quanta in one of the thing and one part of it and the other part is a small quanta so even though the energy is flowing from one way to the other the change mm -hmm. in that where there is large quanta is very small so that can be the regime yes but the problem is then you are not very quantum right <laughs> i see this this is a, it, I, so i i don't have answers to this but it's a very interesting question and this is something we wondered about at the end i think there is another comment sai is raise his hand yes yeah, sai yeah just a quick comment uh, prasanna there is actually mm -hmm. um, optimization solutions that we have shown where basically uh, you can shunt entropy from uh, mm -hmm. from one quantum system to another so so in some sense the adiabatic version of what you're talking about is basically just sideband so, cooling one, so you can one do has kind to of be a, a control little bit careful version. though the reason is uh, i want also the ergotropy of that system that i dump energy into be not to be like very small right i'm i'm considering not just dumping energy that is heat but i'm really wanting to sort of maybe let's say charging a battery that you have also no, worked yeah, on yeah. so that's what, that's yeah, what that's I mean. in that sense is what i meant which is that okay, 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 yeah okay 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 fantastic okay all right good so moving on uh all right. so this is the to this is where the entire thing comes together which is there is indistinguishable system then i have to trace over just the uh, symmetric permutation symmetric states there are only n plus 1 of them whereas if not i have to do the n states okay and then when i do that it's very easy to see in this case when delta is zero my coupling uh, is sx and all that i'm doing is the variance of sx squared in an initial state that is uh, basically uh, e to the uh, minus beta omega of 0 sc so in an sc thermal state and that roughly looks like this where this m squared is nothing but uh, the sc squared uh, uh, average okay so now what one can show uh, what we show analytically is this very this is a simple thing to calculate but it's not a very simple looking expression so i'm not going to write it but i just wanted to say that this expression leads when your n beta c omega of 0 is much larger than 1 for so for large n let's say when beta c omega of 0 is fixed for large n this is still linear okay but it has a factor that makes it uh, with a linear with slope greater than 1 this is a cot hyperbole on the other hand this distinguishable you can already see why it should be n it is just n times sigma x i squared so that is just n right so at large n of course this indistinguishable is going to one sorry indistinguishable is going to win and in at small n one can even show from this expression that this n squared scaling that comes from here will uh, be preserved and this n squared scaling means that of course it's going to be greater than indistinguishable so two advantages that we get the usual n squared advantage from collective systems and also this more than linear or or let's say linear with slope greater than one scaling when n is larger than one in both cases indistinguishable is doing better than distinguishable and this n squared scaling that i'm talking about is with essentially a thermal state i have not sort of worked hard to prepare a particular collective state okay but though i am restricted to the let's say the what in collective physics people call as the bright manifold okay and one can see that basically uh, this this if i plot this expression uh, that i showed uh, in the as a contour plot one can see that at low this is basically the square root of this uh, delta un by u1 this is to show this n squared scaling 
and uh, basically whenever n is small you will see basically the gradients increasing linearly but for larger n the gradients are not increasing linearly and it, uh, basically this becomes a square root n because this is the square root of n over 1 okay i just wanted to show that uh, it's basically a picture summary of what i had written as an expression okay and the final result we have gotten with this impulse coupling and uh, with delta equal to zero is that this indistinguishable engines tend to dump more energy into the system than this distinguishable energy, distinguishable engines. So now I'm going to sort of quickly go through, this is sort of the central kind of result. I'm going to quickly go through on this theme, various generalizations, which we have been able to show as well. And then I'm more or less at the end of the talk, but I will deal with this question about uh, the coupling, how, how much of this energy dump is coming from turning the coupling on and off a little bit at the end, okay? So now I can make this delta non-zero. Again, of course, now this angle is no longer pi by two, and this is the angle at the time of the kick of my engine. What we can show analytically is that in this case, with this impulse coupling, still I can show analytically that this is greater than uh, delta the indistinguishable energy is greater than the distinguishable. Again, there is an advantage. And this is basically the plot of this enhancement as a function of N uh, for basically a particular uh, system. So, so far I had not talked about the system. So this result, the analytical results that does not care about what exactly the system is. And one can show all of this independent of the system. But now to plot this kind of uh, figures, I'm using a particular system, just a harmonic oscillator that is coupled. And these dots are some numerical results of this evolution. And these uh, lines are basically uh, my analytical estimates. Okay. And the reason why I can't go to very large n is because uh, in the denominator here, I have to simulate a 2 to the n size ensemble which are distinguishable so the indistinguishable is much you can do for much larger end. okay uh, so that's the main result that i showed in the beginning okay so now let's take another generalization so right now i don't want to do this impulsive coupling uh, i can just choose a coupling that is slowly turned on as slowly turned on as well as i want and this is somewhat like what uh, archak was asking so let me take a generic coupling gc of t okay and keep still this delta equal to zero. So my basis of my engine is not rotating as time goes. So I'm just changing the energy level separations in these protocols. When I do that, I can again show for any coupling protocol, as long as the coupling is non-perturbative, analytically, we are able to show that again, this indistinguishable uh, engines do better than distinguishable engines. Again, everything is bosonic in distinguishable engines. Okay. So that's again a result we can show. Finally, uh, before we move on, uh, we can uh, take the most general case in some sense where we actually uh, take delta not equal to zero and we put a general coupling. Uh, of course, here we are not able to say anything that is protocol independent. So we choose a particular protocol for the uh, turning on and off the coupling. Uh, it's basically some tan H. And uh, this is during the stroke one, uh, one half of the work stroke, and this is the second half of the work stroke, or the second work stroke. Okay, so this is roughly the form of the coupling. I turn it on and off. And what we see in this case, of course, we have to resort to uh, numerical simulations to see this. We see that generically for small n, without sort of fine tuning parameters, we are able to see enhancement in the sense that the energy dump on the uh, on the external system is larger for a indistinguishable set of engines. Um, and at larger end, uh, as long as our oscillator is not, uh, you know, os this omega is the, now of course I have to also specify my external system because all of this is, in this case, I have to just numerically solve things. Then my omega denotes here the frequency of the external harmonic oscillator system. As long as my uh, system obeys this kind of a condition and this delta is not so large compared to omega of zero, I, one can still see enhancement when I make n large. Okay, so this is something one can only see numerically. Okay, and yeah, so this is what I was saying. So the external system is some harmonic oscillator in this approach, and. Uh, Finally, when we take basically, uh, so this should be delta not equal to zero, uh, or no, this, this example is for delta equal to zero, and we are taking a generic 
non perturbative coupling so finally we make the last generalization which is we now turn on uh, and off a coupling according to some given protocol but we make this g the strength of the coupling also non perturbative just to see the robustness of the result and again for fairly generic parameter regime uh, with delta equal to 0 we see again a the n squares kind of scaling uh, this is the delta u n by u n the n squared scaling preserved for uh, for fairly uh, generic parameter choice for omega of zero and the temperatures of the engines and so on and also the enhancement kind of persists for uh, again this very generic situation except here uh, it's not very generic because i'm really fixing my delta is zero so my engines are basically just being the levels are just being separated and out so there is no coherence produced in the engine strokes let's say okay um, that's the result so now i can come to the last part of my talk uh, do i have about five minutes five yeah. to ten minutes okay fantastic so uh, i want to now address the sort of the one of the uh, questions that came at, came up in the beginning and which i said was somewhat uh, somewhat the let's say conceptually the hardest part of the uh, problem for me which is to understand okay so now i have this external system whose internal energy is increasing uh, because of its coupling to the engine so i want to ask two questions of it to make sure that we are not sort of deceiving ourselves uh, is this actually just heat transfer from the baths to the uh, to the external system obviously we think it would not be for multiple reasons, but mainly because I am sort of setting my coupling to the system to be zero whenever my engines are coupled to the paths. So there is no direct heat transfer as such, but still just to be sure about that, what do we do? We take the final state of this system and we can calculate the ergotropy of this, right? So it's, so basically you can divide this uh, final internal energy change into a passive part and a non-passive part. And we want to see that the non-passive part is also non-zero and has interesting properties. And we see basically that that is the case. So this is the ratio of the ergotropies for the indistinguishable and distinguishable case for an impulse coupling and for non-perturbative general coupling. So in both cases, we see enhancement in that sense for very generic parameters. Okay, So that convinces us a little bit that, okay, this is really delivery of uh, useful energy to the system, right? Uh, that is one good thing. It's not just uh, transfer of heat from uh, from the uh, baths to the uh, to the system. Okay. So the second question is related more closely to the uh, uh, question of uh, is this really is all of this energy coming from switching? Here I must say upfront that I do not have a final answer for this, but we can develop estimates to understand uh, what is the ergotropy content that is transferred. Uh, by due to the switching and one way to do that is to start uh, the system and look at its ergotropy increase from a purely uh, sort of deterministic coupling right so this is hs plus some uh, protocol times vs and choose this protocol by external uh, externally driving the system so i take gc of t exactly as i do with the engine coupling but there is no engine to be coupled here and here I basically use essentially the mean value of my engine operator over the entire cycles and calculate basically what is the ergotropy due to this, right? So in this case, because this GC of T is turned on and off, ergotropy is the change in the internal energy. It's a cyclic process. So one can calculate this ergotropy due to external driving of my system. Now, then I can take the ergotropy that I got from the engine right from the coupling to the engine which i just showed plots of and remove this switching induced ergotropy so to speak and what we see is that typically for delta equal to zero cases we still see that this uh, uh, work content that is removed uh, from which we remove the switching is still showing these enhancement properties it's showing the n squared scaling as well as the, uh, the basically the scaling uh, enhancement with respect to the distinguishable case. And for this to demonstrate it, we did this numerically and we took the worst case scenario of a, sorry, 
uh, the worst case scenario of a non perturbative general coupling, not for these idealized cases, just to see in the worst case, does it work and sort of making a plausible assumption that it should work in general. But of course, one can question, is this the best way to do it? Is there a smarter way to do it? And yeah, so there are questions like that. One can choose a coupling where the switching doesn't uh, sort of take up energy. This is this thermal coupling and so on. And for the thermal coupling, I, I have done sort of numerical calculations where I saw that things work out fine, but we, I have not sort of uh, reported it yet. But that is something that is possible to check. Uh, by thermal coupling, I mean that the uh, VR uh, O times DS, so the coupling operator commutes with the engine Hamiltonian as well as the system Hamiltonian. That's, that's what I mean by thermal coupling. Okay, so <clears throat> with that, uh, the very last thing I want to say is that we talked about bosonic engines so far. And the answer for the fermionic engine is again uh, somewhat expected and it's interesting because you see the way that we couple the engines is such that if you have a fermionic engine let's say that i have a fermionic engine these particles are fermionic operators now and i have a, a trap of course at temperature zero when the uh, external uh, temperature is zero i have to occupy multiple states of my trap because fermions have this poly principle once i do that if n is even in order to exchange energy with the external system, I have to do an excitation, right? So if N is even, this excitation process is blocked because of this poly blocking and essentially the external energy, it's very hard to, uh, you know, uh, get energy out of this fermionic ensemble. On the other hand, if N is odd, one of my particle is not paired and that particle can do work. And basically the N ensemble uh, work, that, oh, sorry, N ensemble energy dump is equal to the uh, effect of having just one particle do the uh, do the energy exchange, which means very simply, if you have distinguishable particles, you have none of these problems, and that will scale as n, and the distinguishable case will do always better than the indistinguishable case when you have fermions at with the center of mass temperature zero. Of course, things become a little bit more complicated when center of mass is not zero, and you have to really look at um, you know, uh, the trap in more detail. Uh, and that is something we, we talk about a little bit, but I don't want to get into it for this talk. Okay. So let me just conclude my talk now. So what we have shown is basically that multiple bosonic engines can deliver energy to an external system at an enhanced rate. And here the enhancement is precisely coming from having permutation symmetry in the set of allowed states of the engines. Okay. And it's not some, um, sort of an effect where I have interactions between the engines or I'm not applying some very specific unitary in some sense. Um, and then finally, as we said, this is all with engines and there's no special preparation needed in the sense of, if you look at collective effects in quantum optics, typically you have to prepare interesting collective states. Here with an ensemble and permutation symmetry, I'm able to basically get some effect that is from just the uh, permutation symmetry. Okay, and in general, I hope but the take home message is that there is a very nice interplay between quantum statistics and thermodynamics. And there are lots of very interesting works that are still coming out. One of which I'm, I'm super uh, excited about and I'm still sort of understanding well is this very recent paper from Gerardo Adesso, where he's talking about Gibbs paradox uh, for, for, for indistinguishable systems. I'm still reading this and this is very recent. And there are also uh, versions where instead of bosons or fermions, you can take anions and look at what, what, what sort of thermodynamics you get with them and so on. Okay, so there are people still thinking about these questions and this might be one interesting way to bring in quantum effects into uh, the business of quantum heat engines. So that's all from me. And I just want to encourage all of you to go to this poster, uh, I think tomorrow, uh, which a former postdoc of uh, mine will present on uh, work that is with Vijay, who's also in the audience, I think. Uh, uh, Madhumita is the name of the uh, postdoc and she'll be present in this poster. Please uh, try to uh, go see this poster as well. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Prasanna. Uh, are there any questions or comments other than those in the middle? Uh, Jorak, please. Yeah, uh, so at some point uh, there was this omega T uh, smaller than one. Uh, I think it was in. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let me. Okay. I think it was for general. Yes. Uh, 
Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I was just wondering, uh, what does this omega t means? Like, why this omega t is smaller than one is important? Or... Yeah. I mean, so one thing that is different is let's see. Uh, if my so I so the honest answer is I don't have a very uh, clear idea of what this means. But I can say what what are the two different regimes. So so if so the point here is that I am taking this capital T to be of the order of omega of zero roughly. So it is about or maybe one order of magnitude larger than omega of zero. Which means this condition you can also think of as the uh, roughly the frequency difference between the engine energy gaps and the energy gaps of uh, the system. So. This condition is requiring that my uh, oscillator frequency uh, be much smaller compared to the engine energy gap. So when the engine energy gap and the oscillator frequency start becoming more and more comparable, what could go wrong? One thing I could see is that, uh, yeah, no, I don't have a very good answer for this. So the, the idea is that they have to be well separated. Uh, of course, there are these term. The, the coupling is S X A plus A dagger. So I'm not doing any rotating wave approximation. Of course, this has some bearing for the rotating wave approximation. But beyond that, I don't see a very deep reason why this is happening. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Have to think. Mm, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I think Bavish has another question. Uh, hi, uh, uh, thanks for the great talk. And I, I just wanted to ask like a side question to this. So mm -hmm. you have all these en uh, all this energy going to the out system, the quantum mm -hmm. system. So so like your like your, this energy would be used to do something in the quantum system. Then like that would be the engine, right? Or are you just limiting the uh, uh, so there definition are, there of are... your efficiency oh, here? I... I think so. So this is why. So so the problem with getting into efficiency or what I'm doing is the fact that I still cannot identify very clearly what switching is doing. But the second answer to what you're saying is also what I'm thinking of is there are two ways in which one can outcouple uh, this this engine, right? So there are two broadly in my head. Uh, one is what is called a piston. So which is mm -hmm. like here, where actually there is no external work stroke. What happens is that the pistons coupling is what is the work stroke itself. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there is something called a load, which is basically an object into which you just dump energy. So mm -hmm. what I'm looking at is more of a load in the sense that I'm interested in putting useful work into the load. So you can think of the load as being a battery that I'm charging. And eventually mm -hmm. I, can, I can make it emit into some mode or I can come right. to another system to extract the work. That's why I'm very concerned about storing work, uh, storing internal energy with significant ergotropy. Otherwise, that's, uh, yeah, it uh -huh. could just be right. heat to heat transfer or something like this. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, okay. great. Um, let's thank Prasanna again for the wonderful and nice talk. Um,